There's a pretty one, Ulysses. Hello Booktube, I'm Sean the Book Maniac. Welcome back to my channel. Here I am with another, in other words, an occasional series where I talk about words that I encounter in my reading. I've got, I think, a half dozen here. Let's get started. The first, oh, and by the way, I have a playlist of all of the ones. I think there's quite a few of them now, several dozen. If you are a word nick, you can have a field day. It's kind of hard to bring them up by uh, YouTube search. They've screwed it up so it doesn't work. So there's a playlist in the show notes. The first one is from the 1748 novel by Samuel Richardson, Clarissa, which I have been reading since I was I was t two years old. No, I've been reading it for, for a couple years now, very slowly. I haven't picked it up now in a couple months, so I need to get back to it. And I'm really enjoying it. So the word there, it shows up in a lot of my reading, but it's one that I've never talked about or never done some research on, and so it's time. And that is Loth, L-O-T-H. I'm pronouncing it the correct way. So many people pronounce it loathe, like the verb, L-O-A-T-H-E, that they're both considered correct. But I didn't actually know all this till I did the research. But the, the hyper-correct pronunciation of the adjective loath is what I just said. And it can also be spelled L-O-A-T-H with no E on the end. And those are the adjectival forms. I've known about it for years. I remember I made my boss 25, 20 years ago, 25 years ago, giggle when I used it in conversation. I was such a nerdy guy in the 90s. You know, now I'm really cool. But anyway, so the sentence in Clarissa. Having gone thus far, loath, very loath, was I to lose my prize once. So the adjective goes back to Proto-Germanic, Old Frisian, Old Norse, Dutch, and so on, to a Proto-Indo-European root light and i wasn't able to find any more information about the root but the adjective originally meant hated hateful hostile repulsive in those good old days in those bad old days it shows up in um, apparently beowulf having that very strong meaning but by about the late 14th century it started to weaken and came to mean averse or disinclined so the adjective pretty much since then it kind of fell out of fashion and then came back into fashion for that weakened meaning of being disinclined or reversed to doing something by about the 19th century, but pretty much limited to literary pronouncements. Did I say that actually um, the, the old stronger meaning also had a connotation of being ugly and that survived into the 15th century in the marriage vow where a man took his wife for fairer or lather, meaning loathsome. So loathsome, we know, means uglies. But so there's the ugly thing is kind of stringing through the etymological family tree here. But then we also have the verb loathe, which means to hate something. So that's where the it started as an adjective, and then the verbal form continued to have that really strong meaning. I loathe him. I hate him. I hate his guts. And that the pronunciation, just like a lot of other words, the difference between breath and breathe, loathe and loathe, However, both the spelling and the pronunciation has gotten so muddled, people can't remember, people screw it up, so th there isn't any, other than really strict prescriptivists, people that think you must never break the rules, but the spelling loath without the A is pretty much only in British English now. It's just interesting to me that the adjectival form weakened, but the verb form stayed very strong hate whereas i am loath to attend the party means i'm disinclined to it's not that i would hate to so i'm not sure if that was very interesting or not but so let's move on to one that i think will tickle your funny bone or tickle your catastrophe because that's the phrase i'll tickle your catastrophe <laughs> it is in this Irish novel that didn't end up working for me all that well, Mary Costello's The River Capture, I couldn't finish it, but it has some lovely language in it. Uh, I could probably do about five episodes of another words from all the vocabulary I found in here, but I didn't really like the novel. And it quotes this line from Shakespeare's Henry the Fourth, Part Two, Act Two, Scene One. Away, you scullion, you rampallion, you fustilarian, I'll tickle your catastrophe. 
So this is the second of the Henry the Fourth plays, and it's just full of insults like that. I'm just going to give like a half a sentence each to the other words scullion. Dates back to the 1400s, used to refer to the lowest ranked servant of a household. And I think scullery is related to that, but we're not going to go down that rabbit hole. Rampalion is more difficult, to, but it seems to be a blend of ramp, meaning to move or act threatening, and rascalion, which is a rascal. Rampalion is kind of like a rascal. Fustelarian is an alteration of the earlier word Fustelugs. we got to put that on the screen. How do you pronounce it? Meaning it's an archaic word used a ponderous, clumsy person or a fat and slovenly woman. Not nice. Fustelarian, same meaning. But catastrophe. <laughs> what, 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 tickle your catastrophe. What the heck? So... It actually means a, a, a person's posterior, their butt. I'll tickle your butt or your butthole or something. One of the meanings of catastrophe, of course, is disaster. But there was another one that was like a disastrous end point of something. And so it came to refer to the end point of something or someone. So I'll tickle your catastrophes. Last time I checked myself out in the mirror, my... My catastrophe was looking rather catastrophic, but we'll move on here. So the word catastrophe, just to pursue that further, a reversal of what is expected, especially the f fatal turning point in a drama, the winding up of a plot. So you can see that is at the end. And that comes from Latin and Greek. And it goes back to the prefix kata and the Proto-Indo-European root, which I would have no idea how to pronounce, streb, here it is. And you can see in that prefix that it tends to mean down, downward, along, below, underneath, so ideas of the end. That prefix shows up in words like cataclysm, catalog, catalytic, cataract, catatonic, catapult. Many, many words like that. Scaffold, catheter, cathedral. I think we might have talked about some of those before. The Proto-Indo-European root, streb, uh, means to wind or to turn. And it shows up in words. They're not as, they're not as common, but there are a lot of literary rhetorical terms. Antistrophe, apostrophe, strabismus, streptococcus, strobe. There's one that still survives. So there you go. Um, if you ever say that you're going to tickle my catastrophe, I'm just going to say, th don't threaten me with a good time. I know what the adjective addled meant, and I encountered it in this book, but, I, you know, when I'm reading stuff and I'm doing this series, it's not that I don't know what it means, but I'm makes me curious when I encounter it for the first time since I started the series. To think, why, why does it mean that? So the word is addled. So the verb addle... The original meaning of it was to become putrid, to be spoiled, to be worthless or ineffective. And that is dates back to the 1640s. And it goes back to the archaic noun, addle, which meant urine or liquid filth. And that went back to an Old English word with the same meaning going to East Frisian, Old Swedish, Middle Low German, Dutch. And there's just been etymological error upon etymological error and when you trace the word history of this. So there's a thing called an addle a. We're going to talk about that in more detail in a minute. But that came into English, the idea of an addle egg, an egg that doesn't hatch, a rotten egg. And that came through the Latin ovum urinum, literally urine egg. And that is a, a mistaken loan and translation from the Greek word that meant, I'm not going to try to pronounce it, that meant putrid egg or wind egg. Because the word for wind, the Latin writers that translated it, they misread it as meaning urine, because it's a very similar word. Are you still with me? So that's how the meaning came into English, meaning putrid and so on. But the um, connotations of the word started to shift a bit into this idea of being empty, idle, confused, muddled, on sound. And that's the modern meaning of adult.
and that gave rise to all kinds of derogatory compounds that are fun to uh, try on. Addle-headed, addle-pated, addle-pate, addle-plot. Addle-plot actually means a spoil-sport. So an addle-plot is the same as a spoil-sport, someone who spoils any amusement. So let's go back to the egg meaning, and if you were following along, that came from this mistaken thing that the Romans didn't import it correctly. Anyway, it's so the noun, or I guess gerund, addling, is the act of causing fertilized eggs to lose viability by killing the developing embryo, by shaking, piercing, freezing, or oiling. So it could mean a, a naturally rotten egg or one that is, I don't, there's some kind of agricultural reason why somebody would want to do that to an egg. I'll let somebody else do that research. And uh, there was a separate word, same spelling, completely different etymology um, in British English to mean to earn something, to earn by labor, to earn money. Very provincial, mostly confined to northern England. So P, P brain has a whole new meaning once you realize the, uh, the etymological reason why to be addled means what it does. The next couple are from this historical novel that I read this year. It's a 2021 release, A Net for Small Fishes by Lucy Jago. Again, not a very successful novel for me, but I did finish it. I think I gave it three stars, maybe maybe three stars. The first one uh, for today is Coddle. Here's the spelling. It means a kind of warm drink given to sick persons or invalids and came into English from the late 13th century from Old North French, not Old South French, Coddle, going back to medieval Lat Latin. And the Proto-Indo-European root is Kelle, and I think we've had other words that went back to this Proto-Indo-European root, but there's a couple different versions of it. This one is the one that means warm. So here's a picture of a coddle. No, it's not a picture of a coddle, Sean the Book Maniac. It's a picture of a coddle cup. According to my research, coddle is always used to describe the beverage or the soup or whatever. It is not used to describe the container. From 1690, and this was part of British cuisine from the Middle Ages into Victorian times. It was thick and sweet, and believed to be particularly suitable or sustaining for invalids and new mothers. The recipe changed over time, but sometimes based on milk and eggs, like eggnog, other times more like a gruel, a drinkable oatmeal porridge. Going back to that Proto-Indo-European root, Kelly, um, we get a lot of interesting words, and I know that we've looked at some of these before. It means warm, and we've, we've got calorie, cauldron, chafe, chauffeur, chowder, coddle, and then molly coddle, uh, lukewarm, I think it was, oh, lee, and lee, we talked about lee side, I think that's right, and nonchalant and scald, all of those go back to that, and in many of them you can really f feel the, the warmth of the Proto-Indo-European root. So coddle, the, the verb to boil gently, and then the, the more figuratively in the modern parlance to treat tenderly to pamper. Molly coddle having the same meaning. So the coddle, the drink, and the boiling gently, and the uh, treating tenderly, all the sound the same. Mummery is the next one. The sentence is, the visitor made a mummery of looking around her. So mummery is a, the, the author did her research. This word came into English in the early 16th century. It's a show or performance of mumming. And to mum was to be secret or silent. And there's the idea, the way that it comes into English through French, meaning to mask oneself. And I think you can see this visitor is kind of looking around, but she's really kind of masking what she's feeling. It's silently. Mummery also came to mean a ridiculous ceremony or ritual. A mummer, the noun, was one who performs in a mumming, an actor in a dumb show. And that goes back to the old French. And then that's where we get, so this is the one that is the most modern, and it's still pretty old-fashioned, but compared to some of these ones going back to the 16th century, the interjection mum, or especially mum's the word. I grew up reading that in books, comic books, and that means keep a secret, be quiet. Mum's the word. And that goes back to this idea of not speaking. 
being dumb, not playing dumb, not letting on that you know anything. As I was preparing for this, I thought, well, that must be connected to the word mime. Well, etymologically, in terms of the scholarship that I could find online, it's not, because mime is an actor who uh, who does pantomime without speaking, right? So you'd think it would be all connected, but uh, it's not. Mime has a different etymological family tree, but I think they should be. Distant relatives, don't you? Finally, in the Viet Tan Nguyen novel, The Committed, one word which is scupper. And scupper is the opening in a ship's side at deck level to let the water out. Came into English in the early 15th century, perhaps from the old French verb escopier, meaning to spit out, or related to the Dutch verb which meant shovel. Um, and they think it's all connected up with scoop. So scoop, you could see a shovel getting the water out. They haven't been able to definitively prove it, but they're so sure that they're kind of writing it up as if it is related to scoop. So scoop came into English in the mid-14th century, meaning to bail out, came from the noun, which was the utensil for bailing out, and that went back to the to the Middle Dutch, West Germanic, and goes back to the Proto-Indo-European root skep, which meant to cut, to scrape, to hack, and scabies we get from that same root. That's all I have for now. Thank you very much for watching. Oh.